Hello, Morgan. How are you? Okay. Good morning from Hawaii. Yeah, that's good. It must be uh, really early where you are. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks for joining us. Yes, very. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so that's great. I don't know who else is. I know Jesse's going to be late today, so. Um, but that's okay. We'll do a meeting. So we weren't, uh, didn't do a meeting last week. Um, and uh, so that's fine. Caught up on some things. And uh, so this week we have some things to catch up on, actually, from last week. And I'll also talk about some other things. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to share my screen right off. And we'll talk about the new thing that I have on the Medium. And I'm going to be posting these on a regular basis. So the first thing, the, uh, the, these features from the meetings. So we've been talking about a lot of topics in the meetings this summer and in the late spring. And, and you know, I try to extract a lot of added value out of those. So I was posting for a while. I was posting on different conversations we were having and putting them into a collection. So they're on the medium. But uh, I'm also posting on topical conversations. So this first one... Uh, is on the topics and extended reality that we did over the spring and summer. So this is uh, it's actually a picture of uh, a virtual reality system in 1897, which was not, uh, you know, it was not a thing, but someone drew a cartoon of it. And this is just kind of a early oh. cin uh, cinematograph is what they called it back then. And you'd put it on your face like this. So even back then, people were thinking about virtual reality systems. They had a fan blowing air into their face, and they were riding on a bunch of uh, on a I don't know if they were logs or rollers, but they were basically simulating this experience of riding a bike. So it's kind of an interesting thing. This is not generated by ChatG or by uh, uh, Midjourney or Stable Diffusion. This is a real cartoon. 1897. And so this uh, has a lot of different screenshots from our discussions, uh, all the readings. Uh, so, you know, kind of indexing all the readings that we had. So I put them all together. We had a feature on VR interface design, which is this hinged buttons idea. We had portals in AR, holograms and digital twins, metaverse standards, spatial computing. Uh, volumetric web slam and volumetric web two, and so forth. So all these are kind of in there by date. They're kind of queued up to the point in the in the meeting where we talked about it. And then we have our YouTube channel for different videos that uh, I've been making mostly. Uh, this is on metaverse, metaverse and spatial computing for research. So this is a bunch of demos that were made in. Uh, Quest and in Magic Leap. And so, you know, it's just kind of like putting on the headset, uh, capturing what you're seeing there, because it's very hard to communicate sometimes what's in those worlds and uh, doing things with it. So there are some demos, some standard demos, some things that I pulled up like maps and actually give a talk or two in the... Uh, Metaverse, I believe. So this is like, uh, this actually is in uh, big screen VR, where I go in there and I gave a, a talk that we had given in the lab. Uh, I'd like to do more of that, but I don't know uh, who else has hardware that they can participate in that sort of thing. So we could do things like meetings in there. We could do things like give talks and so forth. I don't know if it's so much a gimmick or if there's some other value to it. Uh, that's something we have to decide by doing. So, um, yeah, so that's all very interesting. So I also plan to do uh, two more of these features, one on the causality stuff, which we'll finish up on today, and the other on um, 
some of the uh, physical computation stuff, which we'll also finish up today. So Morgan said, uh, very, haha, that must have been in, uh, with respect to the uh, VR thing from 1897. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, so that's, um, and so if you want to uh, contribute to the medium, please submit a post. I know Ankit submitted a post the other day. I'm still working on it to get it out. I want to schedule them so that they don't come out at the same time or one after the other. So I'll probably schedule that for this coming week and also schedule one of the other posts for this coming week so we can have a couple days in between them. But, uh, you know, we, we kind of get like bunches of posts so we don't get them evenly spaced out. But I like to I like to put it out when people send it to me so it doesn't get lost. Okay. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, some of the other things. So I don't know if, well, Morgan, it's pretty early for Morgan. I'll go over what he had shared in the Slack and, uh, Hussein also shared something in the Slack. Hussein, uh, shared this article in the Slack. Um, this is on how Apple Vision Pro could benefit STEM research. This is, uh, where it's just kind of talking about some of the spatial computing in that paradigm and how it's able to contribute to uh, STEM research. So what we have here is uh, they can introduce the Apple Vision Pro, which is, of course, there are a number of different headsets one can use, but of course there's an ecosystem, so they're not all interoperable. Um, why is it useful? It's obvious why gamers, digital artists, and movie fans are excited about Vision Pro. But what promises does it hold for researchers? Well, it hasn't attracted widespread attention. Scientists have already been making use of consumer virtual reality headsets in their research. So, I mean, this has been going on for a while. People have been putting together different combinations of hardware. Um, but, yeah, it's it's, you know, really, you can use it for setting up experiments if you're doing psychology experiments if you're doing other kinds of behavioral experiments you can also set up uh, you know things for sort of experiences so you can actually have demos for you know if you want people to experience a world where you know they're experiencing art or experiencing you know some sort of spatial cognition or some sort of like thing that they wouldn't be you know just to show that the capabilities of the simulation. So, and then there's also data uh, uh, exploration, data visualization. So they give a couple of examples here, automated image analysis and data interpretation. So this is where you could put on a headset and perform real-time analysis of histology slides, identifying features of interest, measuring features and annotating results. So this is for pathology laboratories where they're analyzing things by site. You can uh, use that to improve your sort of perspective on things or, you know, take real-time measurements where you don't have to, like, get out a pair, you know, get out some sort of measurement device and measure across. It can all be integrated. Um, there's also data visualization where you can, uh, you know, bring up, like, a point cloud and walk through it or you can actually use voice commands or gestures to move objects. So really this is a problem of creating a representation of the data or something else that you want to do like a, a histology slide and you have to create a visual or a, you have to create a digital model of that thing. It has to be visual but it can also have other attributes like haptic attributes, auditory attributes and then that's supposed to support people interacting with it. Uh, you can use it for vision ba or precision-based work. So this is where uh, procedures that require high levels of accuracy or dexterity, such as surgery, engineering design, or nanotechnology fabrication. Uh, so, you know, a lot of, there have been a lot of, uh, uh, like the HoloLens, for example, has been put to use 
in factories in where they build um, airplanes. And so the, with building airplanes, you have to, say, put in the wiring. And there's a very complex procedure for putting in wiring. And so you can use an augmented reality device to help you find the right place to put the wires. It's just a, as a guide, and it shows the person doing the wiring where to put them. Um, you know, they've also used these kind of heads-up displays in uh, airline uh, piloting and other types of things where you can't really afford to make errors. Um, and then, of course, in complex surgical procedures where you can guide the surgeon uh, through the anatomy. And that requires everything to be registered in a, in a common framework. So if you're doing spatial tracking, you can keep the objects in line with the thing that you're trying to um, interact with. Uh, you know, you also use these things in the classroom uh, where you want to give lectures or demonstrations. Um, this is, of course, you know, in addition to things like Zoom or things like, uh, you know, uh, teaching aids, uh, applications, mobile applications, things like that. Uh, so this is, yeah, this is, this is not a new thing. Uh, people have been proposing these kinds of um, solutions for a long time. And I think one of the uh, problems with trying to deliver on this has been the software or the hardware and the software. So the hardware, you know, a lot of times the hardware hasn't lived up to what people need. Sometimes it's very hard to maneuver in a headset um, or it's hard to sort of build in those interaction uh, points. You know, how do you build in an interaction point when you're wearing a heavy set of glasses? Uh, so there's a hardware barrier there. You know, the cost of the hardware for maybe like 30 or 40 students. Uh, we're finding that now with our experiments, you know, I, I want to make it so that people can access hardware at a relatively low entry point and then move up. Uh, but that's, of course, going to impact how much you can actually do with it. So that these are all things to consider. And then the software. So can you build software that enables a lot of these things? Um, you know, it's it's not easy to build software for virtual reality. And know shali has been working this summer on building software. Uh, and we're doing a lot, of this, a lot of similar things to what they mentioned in this article. We're trying to do them. And it's not easy. It's a very hard thing to do. It's very memory intensive to build assets, like three-dimensional objects, and get a good mapping of the real world. So it's, it's very difficult to build the software. So this is definitely a nice article. Thank you, Hussein, for that. Uh, and then Morgan has uh, put, we actually had a little conversation in the Slack about um, computational psychiatry. And I know it's very early for Morgan, so I'm not going to put him on the spot right now. But we have this, uh, we had this conversation about, well, it was maybe about two weeks ago now or something. It was about, um, this whole concept of computational psychiatry and what it is. And so, um, you know, we have this channel called Computational Psychiatry in the Slack. And we have, a, and Morgan's the main contributor to this. This is one of his areas. And so this is something where it's, you know, I'm, I'll let him, if he wants to give a presentation on it later, I'll let him do that. But, um, it's, it's some very interesting articles in here. We have a lot of things on, you know, neuroscience, on medicine, on, um, you know, behavioral uh, studies, uh, other aging, uh, a lot of things here in this channel, uh, even on organoids. So there are a lot of things here that um, biological modeling, so there are a lot of things here that have some a lot of promise, and Morgan said he intentionally defines it very broadly. And uh, yeah, I'll let him talk about that another time. But uh, so there are a couple of things, that, a couple of references I wanted to bring to people's attention. So the first one is this uh, computational psychiatry course. This was from 2022. Uh, this was held in New York City. This is CPC++. 
And so this is actually an event that was uh, computational psychiatry conference, I think is the term, the CPC. That's the uh, definition of that. Uh, so it looks like they had a data blitz. They had some other things. So this was um, back in 2022. I'm not sure if they have the sessions online or not, but uh, they had a nice speaker list here program uh let's see oh okay i started a doc or maybe next week yeah that would be great that'd be great to hear about it uh so this one is uh you know they have things like reinforcement learning uh bayesian inference which we'll talk about later as and we've talked about this in terms of causality this is one of the major sort of models of causality is, is using bayesian methods to uh, get at some of these causal aspects of your, you know, whatever you're studying. Um, fitting models to experimental data and model fitting. That's another topic that uh, is quite interesting, not just to computational psychology, but I think, or psychiatry, but I think across like behavioral science and even biological science. You know, you have these models, you have experimental data. You know, they could be statistical models, they could be computational models. How do you fit them to the data? Uh, there are multiple learning systems, uh, multiple so modeling social interactions, behavioral control disorders, um, and then maladaptive perception and beliefs, uh, data blitz talks, which are just basically like talks from data sets that people have collected. I've done these before. Um, Mood and affect, uh, which is emotion, computation and therapy, and then a panel discussion. And so, yeah, this is a nice uh, collection of talks. And okay, this is this is online. The talks are online. I think they're from 20, 2021, 2022. So yeah, the if you look up, I think computational psychiatry conference on YouTube, they should come up. Or maybe they're online somewhere else, but they'll come up and you'll be able to see in details of what this is. So we'll talk, we'll check back on this. We're going to put together a document on it. Uh, but this is this is interesting stuff. Yeah, from their website. So it's on their website. This is uh, cpcourse.org. So actually, let's see if it's on their website. Uh, previous courses. Okay, yeah, there's, well, there's 2019. Oh, they, <laughs> so they have videos here. They have them in a Google Drive. Oh, that's an interesting choice. Um, yeah, you can access things here. This is actually, we started the London Computational Psychiatry course in 2014, so you can find the materials here. Or I guess there's also, yeah, great lectures. So, yeah. So that's uh, that. Then there was another resource he put in the, Slack on is computational psychiatry course from Zurich. Uh, this is just another group of people doing the same thing. This is a, a diagram, sort of, of what how they think of computational psychiatry. Uh, so they're do what they're doing is they have a definition of psychiatry course, which is the introduction introduction of some of the disorders in psychiatry and psychosomatic medicine and how models, meaning computational models, quantitative models, could address clinical needs. So this is where you you have psychiatry and then you want to use, uh, apply modeling to that. Uh, then they have this modeling section, how to build, fit, and compare computational models. So we're fitting models to the data. We're saying that there's a sort of like a hypothesis where you have a model, you say, this is the model I think fits the situation I'm in, the data. You collect data. You set up the experiment so that it can, is comparable to the model. And then you make the comparison. And that's, that's usually the way a lot of modeling is evaluated, whether it's just something we make up in our heads or whether it's like this thing that fits the data. Not all models need to fit data, but in this case, they're making, they're saying, yes, we need to, we need to be, uh, you know, realistic with respect to the data. 
Um, then they have models, of course, def defined as mechanistic models of perception, action selection, and brain connectivity. And then they have another class, which are data-oriented models, like machine learning. So machine learning is where you're like you're discovering things in the data. Your models and mechanism are things where you're trying to model what's going on in the brain. So there are two different things, and of course, you can use both or use them in tandem. And that's that's what their definition is. And this is, of course, when they, they were doing this in the conference, this timeline. Uh, then there's applications, which they talked about on Friday, uh, which was computational models applied in psychiatry research, they have talks and roundtable discussion, and then tutorials on Saturday where you can work with open source software. So this was organized by the Translational Neuromodeling Modeling Unit at the University of Zurich. And it's, so they're, they're kind of approaching this really from almost like a model first uh, approach and kind of getting into that. Um, and again, the past courses are available online. So you have, yeah, so this is the past course here. So there are a number of tutorials. Uh, Bayesian learning using the hierarchical Gaussian filter. Active inference using uh, PYMDP. Reinforcement learning using HBase DM. Drift diffusion models using HDDM. Model inversion using variational Bayes. Machine learning using the PCN toolkit. Dynamic causal modeling, which we talked about with respect to causality for EEG. Uh, dynamic causal modeling for fMRI. So there are two different ways of doing this. Um, there's metacognition using the HMetaD toolbox, advanced models of connectivity, so looking at brain connectivity. And uh, yeah, so that's that's a good sampling of what was going on there. Uh, so Morgan said, uh, so Zurich was first, I think, so like last year, there was Zurich, and then there was the meeting in New York. I was following up on the stats for uh, fit multi-cell they were using Pi ABC, and we can discuss ABC and alternatives. So, what is ABC? I'm not familiar with that. Approximate Bayesian computation. Yeah, it's, there are a lot of methods. It's a method zoo. Yeah, that's versus variational or et cetera. So, um, that's, yeah, there are a lot of methods, uh, a lot of ways to get it, like modeling what's going on, modeling the data. So, yeah, that's. Uh, very, there's variational Bayes and approximate Bayes, and you can use either. Um, I guess they're sort of like not complementary, if I'm understanding variational Bayes correctly. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's great. There, so there are a lot of models in there. Yes, and these are a lot of models. That of course, we talk about during NeuroMatch, or we've talked about in the meeting. Um, so yeah, check it out if you're interested. Um, and the links are in our Slack where you can see the, the topics here, uh, in, in the, uh, recording. Okay. So that's great. Um, yeah, I look forward to hearing about this. If you're interested in going over the, uh, the document next week or the week after. Okay. So. Morgan says here, Friston's definition of comp computational psychiatry is mostly about generative models. Okay. Yeah, he's into a lot of the generative models, uh, irrational Bayes, free energy principle, a lot of that. So, I think that's Friston's original area, if I'm not mistaken, is psychiatry and the, or the sort of fMRI for psychiatry. All right. Um, so, like I said, we have a couple things to get to this week in terms of discussing, wrapping up discussion threads. And I'm trying to make things on the medium for this. So we have the uh, extended realities uh, features that I've put together over a number of weeks. Uh, we also have our physical computation discussion, which went on for probably about five or six sessions, including today. And then we have this uh, causality discussion. 
So the causality discussion started several weeks ago. We had an hour-long session on that. And I'm putting together the post, so I know the length of time that was spent on it. Um, and then 15 to 20-minute chunks afterwards. <coughs> I'm kind of following up on the things that we talked about in the first one. So I'm going to start with the causality one first. Let me share my screen. Right. So today we're going to talk about causal systems and networks. And so this is about sort of networks and applying causality to systems maybe that are um, less obvious in terms of what the causality is. And then there's some other approaches which we'll talk about um, going you know, to sort of a conclusion of this discussion. So the first thing uh, is this, this is actually from electrical engineering. So this is from a different field as neuroscience or, or psychiatry or anything else where we're do, looking at behaviors. We're looking at things maybe that are, have a, you know, we can understand what the cause is. Uh, it's, it's kind of intuitive to us as human beings, as, as people who have a brain. Um, but this is kind of going through causality in electrical engineering, which is sometimes a little bit, you know, you might think, well, that's obvious that the causality is there. But um, this is kind of this take on it. So uh, we have, this is by Tom McCurdy. Um, this is, I can't remember where this is from exactly, but it was from a thing on the Internet that I, this is from 2007. Uh, we have been going over causal systems, and I have still... Is still having trouble determining what defines a system to be causal. I was told that if the input is anything besides x, a, t, where a one equals one is uh, where a equals one, then the system is non-causal. I can kind of see this, but it's still a bit blurry for me. I was wondering if that would still apply if you remove t or time directly from the input equation. So you have this x a function with time. Uh, where you know if a is one, then the system is non-causal. Uh, say like if you had this integral here, which is uh, a function that integrates from uh, negative infinity to t, and then there's this function here that's uh, trying to integrate, then this is automatically not causal because the five coefficient inside the x. So this is not causal, uh, and then this is uh, from the, the later in the discussion, that's not true. The system defined by this equation, yt equals xt minus one, is causal, although xt minus one, uh, the general definition for a causal system, linear or nonlinear, time invariant or time variant, is, and this is in electrical engineering, so we're interested in signals, input signals, output signals. Given two input signals, x1 and x2, such that they're equivalent for any time uh, after zero. Uh, if the system is linear, then we apply a signal. The output should be, uh, it should be this uh, subtractive uh, term here. So the condition for the system to be causal in the case of linear systems reduces to if uh, time equals zero or times above zero, then the function is zero for basically what they're doing is they're adding a signal into the system and they're looking at it over time. And so they're looking at what they call linear causality, which is where if you apply something to the signal, it has an effect, uh, a proportional effect. So this is a linear causality system. And of course, so, so you can see the output depends on values of ti, but we know now only that only for and thus the output will not be zero for any, which means that the system is not causal. Uh, so this is I never I this is maybe a little bit above my head on what they're talking about, what the use cases are, but um, this is basically linear causality and kind of putting a mathematical framework around it. Uh, now there's some other things here. Uh, so this is a paper anticipative and non-anticipative controller design for network control systems. And so one of the things in causality is this anticipatory system uh, method, which is something that I think we talk about with um, a lot with Robert Rosen 
and uh, A.M. Louie, who came up with these ideas of anticipatory systems, uh, which are basically systems that can anticipate things. Um, so, you know, in biological systems, you have anticipatory things like uh, how you have a physiological system that anticipates uh, like noise or, uh, you know, scarcity or things like that. So like, things like, you know, uh, adaptive plasticity, I guess, would be considered anticipatory. And so this is what they're getting at here in the electrical engineering context, not in the biological context. And so this is for network control systems. So a summary of this is uh, we propose a numer numerical procedure to design a linear output feedback controller for a remote linear plant in which the loop is closed through a network. The controller stabilizes the plant in the presence of delays, sampling, and packet dropouts in the sensor measurement and actuation channels. We consider two types of control units, anticipative and non-anticipative. So these are different types of control units. So now we have these control units, <clears throat> which are uh, like their feedback mechanisms. Uh, basically, they're doing things that uh, allow you to put in a signal and get a response. Uh, and then sometimes if the signal goes up or down quite a bit, it can smooth those things out. It, you know, if you're controlling a, ser a servo mechanism or an electrical system, you know, you can control uh, the input and produce an output. Or you can predict sometimes the output from the input. You can do th things like that. And so what they have in these control units is we have an anticipative one and a non-anticipative one. So causality, of course, as you can imagine, is very important in this. In both cases, the closed loop system with delays, sampling, and packet dropouts can be modeled as delay differential equations. Uh, so uh, a couple months ago, I think in the Devo War meetings, I talked about delay differential equations. And so these are these dynamical systems equations that have a term in them that represent delay. So it's usually a tau. Uh, uh, parameter. And so the tau parameter is this delay. So if you have like some sort of uh, function, and I'm going to go to my Jamboard now. So your delay differential equation might be something very simple. Um, so you have like fx equals x plus or tau. So something very simple. This uh, tau is uh, the delay factor. So it's just where you're putting in a, a factor that kind of slows down the linear input. And so if you have a graph like this, you have maybe like something like a linear function that goes up. If I have my delay term, it might look something like this or something like this. Basically, that delay is being added into the x, and it's it's going up. And so this is uh, how you apply these kinds of things. In a control context, you'd have a, a plant where you'd have feedback, and you'd have like some sort of set of things that are being controlled. And you might have a feedback here. And so that's your, the way it would maybe be on this feedback here, or even on one of these uh, feed forward elements here, and it would, uh, you know, it, it allow you to affect the system. So you might delay the system signal to anticipate something to happen, maybe coming in as a secondary input or something. And so that's, that's what they're talking about. And this is useful, of, of course, not just in electrical engineering, but also in physiology and other systems where you know, we want to understand different things that are going on, different dynamics. Um, so uh, our method of designing the controller parameters is based on the lyapunov uh, krasovsky theorem and a linear cone complementary algorithm or complementarity algorithm. Numerical examples show that the proposed design method is significantly better than the existing ones. Okay, so they've They've done this, uh, they're doing this comparison uh, to transmit a continuous time signal over a network. 
the signal must be appropriately sampled to be carried over a network because atomic units called packet. Um, so they have these discrete units that they're measuring. They want to send uh, things over a network. These are packets, of course. Hence, there are some similarities between NCSs and sample data systems due to the sampling effect. NCS are significantly different from standard sample data systems since the delay in the feedback loop can be highly variable due to both access delay, the time it takes for the shared network to accept data, and transmission delay, the time during which data are in transit inside the network. Both types of delays depend on highly variable network conditions such as congestion and channel quality. And so this is where these delays, they're important to model them. Sometimes you want to anticipate them so you don't end up with a lot of congestion in the network. And so this is what they talk about. They're talking about packet dropout, which is where you get things that drop out of the network. You get other types of delays that you have to account for to keep things synchronized and so forth. So they kind of give this uh, mathematical definition of these control units. So this is a, a very complicated equation and kind of talk about how to implement this. Um, this is the tau uh, parameter shows up in the equations here. So, you know, this is these are delay terms. Um, so uh, Ranicki et al. modeled NCS as discrete time systems. So that's what we're doing here. We're modeling this as a discrete time system. We're adding in a delay. The delay is discrete. So you have some number that just basically is the, it's maybe a negative number that, that will delay the system uh, by a certain amount. However, this approach requires the assumption that the total delay in the control loop is smaller than the sampling interval. So you can't have a delay that's larger than the sampling interval. Otherwise, the analysis becomes significantly more complex. Uh, alternatively, NCSs can be modeled as delay differential equations which is something that I mentioned, uh, which are actually quite complex. They're just basically uh, ODEs or, or PDEs, which are partial or ordinary differential equations, but you have that delay term in it that delays the signal. So it's, it's you know, it's sort of, it's not nonlinear, but it adds this uh, delay to it. Uh, after, for which after, the aforementioned restriction, which is this need to have the delay be shorter than the sampling interval, can be easily lifted. So if you use a DDE, it's a more powerful mathematical tool. It allows you to model it better. Um, an NCS with an LTI plant model, anticipative or non-anticipative controller with delays, sampling and packet dropouts can be modeled as a DDE of the form shown here. And so this is your DDE. Uh, and so the, you know, this is the delay bonds for TI min and TI max are one and two, uh, are positive and depend on the sampling intervals, maximum number of consecutive packet dropouts, and upper and lower bounds on the delay of measurement in the actuation channels. So this kind of talks about the related work, uh, notations, and then this is their uh, control systems modeling here. And so you can see that there's this aspect of causality in this kind of <clears throat> uh, technique. This is hardcore electrical engineering. So I'm not going to get into the paper anymore. But just this, the takeaway from that is that we have these systems that have feedback. We can have these delay mechanisms in them to uh, model changes in feedback. And then, of course, this affects the causal relationship between things. Okay, so there's also this issue of uh, causality in different types of systems that interact. And we talked a little bit about um, networks, and of course in, in uh, brain networks or connectomes, there's this issue of causality. So is, is if A goes to B, B goes to C, and C goes to A, what's the causality of that? You know, usually you have to have this sort of assortativity and transitivity assumption that you're working from that sort of make things where you have to have them sort of separable. And uh, this is not always the case in a lot of real world systems. So in eco complex ecosystems, this is a famous example of 
you know, a complex system that interacts. And so, you know, you don't really have the luxury of disentangling all this, these causal uh, mechanisms. You know, you can't really be reductionist about it. You have to analyze it in, in the context of those causal loops. And so this is from uh, George Sugihara, Robert May, and some co-authors. Sugihara is known for working on ecosystems in the context of complex systems. Robert May's done a lot of that work too. So this is uh, this is talking about detecting causality in complex ecosystems. So identifying causal networks is important for effective policy and management recommendations on climate, epidemiology, financial regulation, and much else. We introduce a method based on nonlinear states-based reconstruction. So this is a tool from uh, complex systems analysis. Uh, where they have this reconstructing a nonlinear state space that can distinguish causality from correlation. So I remember, uh, I think in the first session, we talked about the difference between correlation and causality. So causality is where one thing causes another. We can figure out like, that that's not a spurious correlation, based on a spurious correlation, that it's indeed a causal mechanism in the real world. So correlation could be any two things that uh, show a relationship where there's a there's a co-occurring tendency. So of course we know that like correlations are these sort of you know if you think of a classical regression, uh, you have you know two things that are correlated like you kind know, of baseball wins and And you could progress that against something like cloudy days. And you could find like something of a correlation there. And of course, the problem is, is that that's not really, uh, it's a spurious correlation. There's no relationship there. There's nothing that's causing one, causing the other. It's just kind of that they play out in a way that looks like a trend. It might fit a statistical model, but it's obviously there's no there's no agency here of one affecting the other. So this is something that we have to watch out for, these spurious correlations. Now, causality, of course, takes us a step further and says, if we think that there is a relationship between cloudy days and baseball wins, or baseball wins and cloudy days, then what is that relationship and what are the components of it? So we might, if we were like superstitious, you know, we wear the same shirt every cloudy day to make sure our baseball team wins, we would invent this big, you know, model of different factors that would kind of describe what was going on. And of course, this is all kind of spurious nonsense. But it does bring up this idea that you're building a causal model. And of course, people build causal models all the time. They build them for purposes of understanding the world. Uh, in superstitious uh, beliefs, you know, people will build these very elaborate models of the world with agency given to, you know, all sorts of natural things. So this is something that isn't unusual, but we have to watch out to make sure that we're not building something, uh, you know, building a causal model on shifting sands or on a spurious correlation. So this is something that, you know, in, in networks is a problem because in networks, a lot of things interact with each other. And it's hard to really know what the spurious correlations are from the actual correlations that can lead us to understanding these mechanisms of causality. Um, so this is on networks. Their method extends to non-separable, weakly connected dynamical systems. So there's that word again, separable. So in order for these things to be correlated, they have to be separable, but you also have to have things that are separable. So if you have an interaction between two things, in a network between three things in a network, you have A, B, and C, right? You want to have this transitivity assumption where A causes B, B causes C. And then if C causes A, then you're kind of in trouble because they're not separable any longer. They're all integrated. And the thing is, is that if you think about this at time, A has to come first. If these things are separable, 
if these things are transitive. A comes first, and B comes first, and C comes first. So we can understand sort of the origin of this causal chain. If C causes A, then we're in trouble because C comes first, or B comes first, or they all come first. And there's no, uh, you know, no way to tease that out. Now, the problem is that sometimes those are, that's what happens, actually. Uh, you know, you have like a system that emerges, and these things all come online together. Or, you know, uh, they may come online in different, under different guises. So they're not A, B, and C when they emerge as a, a interacting unit. They might come online in uh, different forms and then kind of form that unit when those things are fully formed. Um, be, beyond that, I'm not going to get into that too much more. But just suffice it to say that it's hard. There's an origins problem sometimes or causality. And that is, what came first? Is it, you know, the thing that's at the beginning of the causal chain or, you know, what, what's going on there? So that's what they mean by separability. Then there are these weakly connected dynamical systems. So the connection very much matters in causality. And when they're weakly connected things, um, you know, that's something that is, um, you know, it makes it harder to understand the causality. And then they say case is not covered by the current Granger causality paradigm. So we talked about Granger causality, where you have two time series. That, you know, you use one time series to predict another time series. You lag the second time series, so you take, uh, say, like the first five inputs of A, can it predict on B, but also you take the first five elements of B, and you use that to sort of predict. So you want to be able to, you know, see if A causes B. You think, well, A has, does something, and then it has an effect on B, but it, it has an effect a little bit later. So if we actually, if we put all this together in a sort of a, a way of thinking about this. So we have our two time series. And this is relevant for ecological networks or other types of interacting systems as well, because these interacting systems often contain these sort of time series. So this is in time. And then we have our A, where we have our events or antecedent events. And we're trying to predict for this unit on B. So all of these units will predict on B. So it's basically, we apply this time lag to B. We ask the question, do these units here in A, the activity here, maybe we summarize it by through a mean or something, does this predict what's going on in B? Does this have an effect on B? All right. But then we can also ask, does B have an effect on B? Which is, does this history have an effect on B? And we can ask that question as well. But I think the important thing here is that there's this time lag. So now we're actually applying like a, a lag or, you know, this sort of delay differential approach to these two time series. And this is, of course, the Granger causality paradigm. And so what they're arguing now is that this is a linear model, so this is A predicting B. We know what the, you know, the two time series are separable, they don't interact, they don't overlap, so their signals are different, they're lagged. It's, it's a nice sort of um, neat system. Now, in there, what they're saying is that A and B might say overlap, so you might have A and B kind of coming together like this as two time series. So this is like basically my area of overlap that I'm showing here. So they might actually be the same thing for a while and then split apart, which is analogous to some network interaction that is not separable. You might have things going on like weak interactions where you might be able to characterize the interaction if it's a strong interaction, but if it's a weak interaction, it's very hard to sort of characterize it. So this is a strong interaction where A is causing B, but we can tell, kind of using a quick and down and dirty method, what that interaction should look like. It should be linear. It should shift this value somewhat separate from this counterfactual of just B. So we don't want this, you know, changing and changing with respect to A. 
you know, like this. And we say, oh yeah, A is, or A is affecting B, but in fact, they're just, their covariance is maybe because it's the same thing and it has no effect on the other thing or, you know, it's it's just spurious. So that's what, we, what we're trying to test here. And this is the role of interactions versus these sort of separable linear systems with strong interactions versus weak interactions. This approach is illustrated by both simple models where in contrast to the real world, we know the underlying equations and relations and so can check the validity of our method and by application of real ecological systems, including the controversial sardine anchovy temperature problem. And so this is, in this sardine anchovy temperature problem, we're actually getting into uh, a lot of the things we just talked about with control systems and cybernetic regulation and things like that. So this is, of course, they're interested in this method called convergent cross mapping, where they want to show correspondence between different manifolds. They're using, of course, these attractors, which is, you know, a way to represent dynamical systems, and they're looking at differences in the manifolds. They're looking at mirage correlations, which I kind of showed before, but this is where you have these time series that kind of look like they're affecting one another, but they're actually a mirage. They, they're not, they're just sort of co-varying, but not in a way that's causal or even like related to one another. They're just kind of overlapping because maybe there's similar processes, but they're actually not affecting one another. And so that's, that's, you know, these are things that we need to worry about. We have bidirectional coupling, unidirectional coupling, external forcing of non-coupled variables, and then a complex model where we have both, that in fact. So we can have interactions and we can maybe get at the interactions, but then we still have this problem of mixed systems where we have some things that look like this and some things that look like this. And so that's that's where you get into trouble too, because it's not you know it's not like you can't just use one method; you have to use other methods. Um, and then so then they demonstrate with ecological data some of these methods and illustrate them, detecting causation in real time series. So this is a time series here where you have these two species interacting, um, and you know ecological interactions are interesting because we usually use sort of these population means for things. We use measures like abundance. And so we're looking at different, you know, we're looking at a predator-prey model basically where when one uh, species is affecting the other species in terms of abundance, uh, there's a lag because there's a lag in the effect. If the abundance of one species goes up, it drives down the other species, but there's a lag and so on and so forth. Um, but the thing is, is that it's, there is this lag and, and it's not uniform. So we can't say it's every five points or every 10 points, like what they usually do in Granger causality. It's, you know, maybe aperiodic, meaning there's no period that's necessarily uh, characteristic of this interaction. So it could happen quickly. It could happen with a very long lag. There are all, there are all sorts of variation here. So, and especially over multiple years. So if you look at different time scales, you get different effects. And so then what do you say about causality? Do you say that one thing causes another if the time scale is different or if the, the, it's aperiodic? Um, that, you know, maybe not. <laughs> we don't know. So, you know, really this is about kind of almost uh, kind of uh, being sort of uh, critical or having this sort of uh, contrarian view of what we've talked about so far, because it, it brings up all those sort of the caveats and objections to some of the formal, more formal causal models. This is another article on causality networks. Uh, this is from, uh, I, can't, I don't know what field this is, but they talk about Granger causality. They talk about some of these models. Um, and this is a nice article because it kind of talks about this in a very statistical way. So it doesn't necessarily map to any one system, but it actually shows the sort of the theory. Um, so if we zoom in on this a little bit more, even uh, these graphs here, 
This is correlation versus, versus causal dependence. Uh, this is a, a, a sine wave correlated with no causal relationship. So we have these two things that are correlated that don't have a causal relationship. They just happen to have this sort of uh, phase locking that, you know, there's not, they're two independent things but they look like they could be correlated. And that's the difference. So we want to be able to distinguish something like that from something where we have a time series, and this is not a, a, a sine wave, this is a more complex signal, but where there's this causality. So you see the phase change here. This is anti-phase one to the other. This is not anti-phase, but there are shifts in the phase that are sort of, you know, it's like the predator-prey example we saw where one is affecting the other, but it's not at any given period. There's a lag that's variable, but we want to be able to detect causality if it does exist. So that's kind of what we, we think about when we think about networks and time series, and we're adding these two together now. So the abstract of this paper reads, while correlation measures are used to discern statistical relationships between observed variables in almost all branches of data-driven scientific inquiry, what we're really interested in is the existence of causal dependence. So this is where we don't want causal independence, we have causal dependence, when one thing affects the other. Statistical tests for causality, it turns out, are significantly harder to construct. The difficulty stemming from both philosophical hurdles, making precise the notion of causality, and the practical issue of obtaining an operational procedure for a philosophically sound definition. So there's a lot of uh, sort of a philosophical underpinning here that we need to think about. In particular, designing an efficient causality test that may be carried out in the absence of restrictive presuppositions on the underlying dynamical structure of the data at hand is non-trivial. Nevertheless, the ability to computationally infer statistical prima facie evidence of causal dependence may yield a far more discriminative tool for data analysis as compared to the calculation of simple correlations. So they're looking here at a new non-parametric test of Granger causality. <clears throat> so we talked about that for quantized or symbolic data streams generated by ergodic stationary sources. So they're not looking at aperiodic sources necessarily to test this. They're looking at ergodic stationary sources. <clears throat> and so it's a little bit easier to talk about in contrast to state-of-the-art binary tests, our approach makes precise and computes the degree of causal dependence between data streams without making any restrictive assumptions, linearity or otherwise. Uh, without a priori imposition of specific dynamical structure, which means we don't think about any particular time series, uh, we infer explicit generative models of causal cross-dependence, which can then be used for prediction. These explicit models are represented as generalized probabilistic automata, uh, referred, and, uh, referred to as crossed automata, and are shown to be sufficient to capture a fairly general class of causal dependence. So we're interested in the dependency of these two, like two time series. We're interested in, the remember, the dependence is this network topology. So the dependence is this thing having an effect on this other thing, A having an effect on B. This is as opposed to, say, like a, a point cloud where everything is independent, everything is distributed in an independent fashion, and we get these, you know, we can't really say anything about the causality, uh, but we can't necessarily say anything about the causality here either. This is a different type of data. Uh, so they, they've developed this method. So... Uh, they tested on a number of things. It's just kind of another example of this, these causal networks and this issue of causality in time series. Okay, so this is another kind of interesting figure I found. This is where, actually I had the Internet Encyclopedia definition of causation, <clears throat> and I'll go over that because it's open in my tabs. So this is actually from the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy and this is actually something that we might, again, with respect to the philosophy, be really interested in going over. It's really long. I don't want to go over it, but it basically gives a, you know, 
a family tree of causal theories. This is where I got this figure from. So this is a family tree of causal theories. Um, you know, just kind of under one way of understanding the relationship between different historically significant and still influential theories of and approaches to and even understandings of the philosophical problems posed by causation. Uh, so some of these theories motivate each other, in particular nominalism and the regularity theories that often go hand in hand. So they talked about semantic analysis, regularity theories, uh, the problem of implausibility in enormous cases, implausibly enormous cases. Um, a cause must be eno enormous for it to be truly efficient, sufficient for an effect. It must include, include everything that, if on another occasion is different, yield an overall condition that is followed by a different effect. But it, it is questionable that cause is reasonably understood as referring to such an enormousness. So there are really a lot of interesting concepts in causality. Um, something called Hume's Challenge. And I talked about the philosophy of the philosophical underpinnings of causality before. And there's this aspect of causality I think it's interesting to kind of go over. So uh, there's the top level and then there's approaches to the challenge, ideas about what the main challenge is. And then the second level are theories, answers to the challenge. Uh, so the first is semantic analyses, which are regularity, counterfactual, interventionist, which is like an experimental setup where you manipulate variables, and probabilistic. Uh, the second is ontological stances, which are nominalist or humean, realist, dispositional, and process theories. The third is Kantian stances, which is Kant's own, Kant's own view, uh, and then agency. And then skepticism, which is Russell, Russellian republicanism, and pluralism and thickism. And then what are causal relata? So this is kind of framing this in the context of some of the uh, philosophical challenges. I'm not going to get any more into this because I don't really know. This is, again, above, a little bit above my head. Uh, okay, then at Wikipedia, if you go back to Wikipedia and you look at what they talk about in terms of a causal system, so is, we were talking about causal relationships, causality, now they're causal systems. And so in control theory, a causal system, also known as a physical or non-anticipative system. So this is interesting that they, in control theory, they talk about causal systems as being non-anticipative. And that's a, sort of the definition we talked about in the first paper, I believe, is a system where the output depends on the past and current inputs but not future inputs. So he talked about anticipatory systems, how they anticipate things that will happen in the future. That may mean that they need a more open stance in terms of their response criterion. They may mean that they actually need to make some assumptions about the future. And I'm talking about a system, so I don't want to make it sound like I'm anthropomorphizing things. But there has to be this model of the future somehow, either through fle an increased flexibility or through actually predicting things in the future, or trying to. So the outputs depend on past and current inputs. So it's very much almost like Bayesian or even Markovian, in the sense that it doesn't, well, actually, it couldn't be Markovian because it doesn't have a memory, but definitely kind of a Bayesian model. There are no future inputs um, uh, at the outset. So uh, the output y t0 depends on only on the input for values above zero time. The idea that the output of a function at any time depends only on past and present values of input is defined by the property commonly referred to as causality. A system that has some dependence on input values from the future, in addition to possible dependence on past and current input values, is termed a non-causal or a causal system. A system that depends solely on future input values is an anti-causal system. So that's interesting that if you just take future input values, just predicting those, that's actually an anti-causal system. Uh, I don't know why exactly, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Note that some authors have defined an anti-causal system as one that depends solely on future and present input values. So it's almost like the opposite of a non-anticipative system where you have the 
you know, you sort of have your present observations and then you say what will happen in the future. And otherwise you have no memory of the past. Uh, so this is, a, you know, if we draw this out again, let's draw it out. You have the past and this is, of course, again, Bayesian models. This is the prior, right? And then the present, which is sort of Markovian, it could be an empirical observation. And when I say Markovian, I mean it is uh, something that can just spit out states. So like a Markov machine or a Markov model where it's spitting out like states that it's generating. And then the future, which of course, if you go, I mean, you can just estimate future states. Sometimes you need present values, but sometimes you could just basically say what's out there in the world and what's the probability. And so a future state would be, you know, a probabilistic model maybe. So what they're saying here is that if you have a past and present, if you have the present only, and this is my take on it, this, this is a kind of a Markovian, we already said that the past and the present is, is sort of uh, this is a Bayesian model. And this is a sort of a non-anticipatory system. Not anticipating anything into the future. It's just going from the past to the present. An anticipatory system includes all of these. And then, like when you do present and future, that is anti causal, or I guess a causal. Basically, doesn't really care about the cause. It only cares about the future. So the cause is in the past, right? The output of the cause is in the present. So if I'm going from A to B, it's past to present. If I'm going from B to C, that could be the future. But I can't know if B and C are, say, independent or, uh, you know, transitive if I don't know A to B. So if I don't have this information, I can't say if this is causal. So it's, I, it's an interesting kind of uh, approach to this, but <clears throat> um, but anyways, this is the way this is the way people think about this. Classically, nature or physical reality has been considered to be a causal system. Physics involving special relativity or general relativity require more careful definitions of causality, as described elaborately in the physics stuff. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting is that, like, there's this idea of retrocausality in physics. And so, uh, retrocausality is where you're trying to take the present and predict the past, but in some physical systems, that's something you want to do almost as if you were trying to predict the future. So, this sort of model breaks down, or this flow is like basically the present is trying to predict the future, but that's kind of equivalent to predicting the past. It's kind of a weird thing. Uh, FQXI had a competition several years ago, an essay competition on uh, talking about retrocausality. And so there may be some uh, essays there you might check out and see what people are thinking. Uh, so yeah, for a causal system, the impulse response of the system must use only the present and past values of the input to determine the output. This is a requirement. This requirement is a necessary and sufficient condition for a system to be causal, regardless of linearity. So this is interesting. This idea of necessity and sufficiency. And so in the blog post I'm going to put together, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more with respect to how they approach this in biology. But basically, necessity is something that needs to be there for this 
this thing to happen. So if we're thinking about a system with parts, how does it work? We want to find the causality of it. Is it, you know, is the thing that we're looking at, how does it fit into that system? Is it necessary or is it sufficient? So sometimes something can be necessary, meaning it has to be there for the thing to work. And sometimes something can be sufficient, meaning that it's only that thing that needs to be there. It can work if only that thing is there. Uh, so th there is this difference between necessity and sufficiency. And a lot of, in a lot of biological experiments, people use this sort of criterion for determining, you know, uh, like a gene in a, in a network. Is it necessary? Could you remove it? And, you know, if we removed it, it wouldn't work. Uh, if, if it's there, then it'll work. And the only way you can do that is through this sort of uh, manipulation, this sort of experimental manipulation where you remove parts and add things in. The sufficiency criterion is if I just had this gene and nothing else, would that be sufficient to run the system? And so this is another thing that you can test with experimental methods. Now, there was a paper that I'm going to post it in the blog post that talks about this as not really being sufficient, pardon the pun, for biological investigations. People use this all the time in biology, especially in molecular biology, these necessary and sufficiency criteria. But this isn't really enough to describe biological causality as we've seen in this typology here. That's not enough. So we need to have better ways of doing this. So I'll, I'll finish up with this idea of the anti-causal system uh, in systems theory, the anti-causal system is a hypothetical system with outputs and internal states that depend solely on future input values. So this is where we have future values we want to predict. Some textbooks and published research literature might define an anti-causal system to be the one that does not depend on past input values, allowing also for a dependence on present input values. In the a-causal system, is a system that is not a causal system, that is one that depends on some future input values and possibly on some input values from the past or present. So again, in our typology here, we have a-causal and anti-causal, and I kind of lumped them together, but they're not exactly the same thing. So um, this is in contrast to a causal system, which depends only on current and or past input values. This is a topic in control theory and digital signal processing. So if you want to know more, we can go there and talk about that. Anti-causal systems are also a-causal, but the converse is not always true. An a-causal system that has any dependence on past input values is not anti-causal. So an example of a-causal signal processing is the production of an output signal that is processed from an input signal that was recorded by looking at input values both forward and backward in time. In reality, that present time input as well as the future time input values ha have been recorded at some time in the past. But conceptually, it can be called the present or future input values in this a-causal process. This type of processing cannot be done in real time as future input values are not yet known, but is done after the input signal has been recorded and is post-processed. And so a digital room correlation and some sound rate production systems rely on a-causal filter. So this is a topic in data mining, knowledge discovery, in signal processing, and the Laplace transform, and things like that. So that's all I'm going to talk about with respect to causality. I think that was a good, it was a lengthy overview, more lengthy than I thought it would be, but that's fine. Any questions about that or comments? Okay, so that's causality. Uh, I would say that I didn't know any of this when I started this, so I've learned a lot here. So the next thing I want to talk about is the physical computation. So we're going to finish that up as well. So let me share my screen once again. Okay, so this is physical computation. Uh, so I'm gonna finish up with a couple of uh, topics, Top topology and computation morphological computation, and RNA is universal computation. So I think we left off last time, we're kind of getting into the uh, physical computation in life and in materials, and it's sort of, you know, one of these areas that we started out with the brain as a computer, we're kind of getting into these other areas, 
And of course, in physical computation, that's important because what we call physical computation, we have to draw inspiration from a lot of different areas. And so one big area is this area of physics and physical objects computing. And so there's this whole theory that we can draw from here. So this is a nice article on physics, topology, logic, and computation of Rosetta Stone. This is uh, from the archive. This was published in 2009, so it's been a while. But this is John Baez, who does a lot of really cool stuff on Mastodon, on uh, mathematical features and things like that. So um, the abstract reads, uh, so they get into category theory in this. We had a category theory article, I think, in the first or second session. That's really kind of interesting that we're circling back to category theory here. Um, the abstract reads, in physics, Feynman diagrams are used to reason about quantum processes. In the 1980s, it became clear that the underlying, that underlying these diagrams is a powerful analogy between quantum physics and topology. So topology is the about it's mathematics of surfaces and objects. You think about a donut, that's a topology, has a hole in it, it has like this curvature. Um, Namely, uh, a linear operator behaves very much like a comorbid, uh, comorbidism, <laughs> which is the way you pronounce that, I guess. A manifold representing space time going between two manifolds representing space. So, this is a space time object. Uh, this led to a burst of work on topological quantum field theory and quantum topology. But this was just the beginning. Similar diagrams can be used to reason about logic, where they represent proofs and computation, where they represent programs. So in logic, we have proofs. and computation, we have programs. We talked about that with respect to how uh, Stephen Wolfram views physical computation. So one of the things you need for that is a program. So we're making this link between logic and, or between proofs of logic and programs of computation. And then, of course, we're making this link to um, topology, which is, of course, uh, where kind of we want to go with this. With the rise of interest in quantum cryptography and quantum computation, it became clear that there is extensive work, an extensive network of analogies between physics, topology, logic, and computation. In this paper, we make some of these analogies precise using the concept of closed symmetric lenoidal category. And this is from uh, category theory. And so they use this concept to build upon some of these analogies. Uh, so apparently you don't need to know anything about category theory to get through this. But this is an example of topology. This is um, a linear operator as a diagram. Here's a Feynman diagram. And then you, so you can reason about quantum uh, theory pictorially using these. So we want to have this sort of uh, image or this diagram of what's going on. This linear operator behaves like a cobordism that is an n-dimensional manifold going between manifolds in one dimension less. So this is an example of this as a topology. Um, string theory exploits this analogy by replacing the Feynman diagrams of ordinary quantum field theory with two-dimensional cobordisms, which represent the world sheets traced out by strings and passage of time. Um, so that's where they, they, what they were talking about before. This is the Rosetta Stone, which are these analogies. So in category theory, you have these, uh, these uh, sort of things that you're doing, these objects and morphisms. In physics, these are analogous to systems or processes. In topology, these are manifolds and cobordisms. Uh, and then in computation, this is a data type, so an object in category theory. Is analogous to a data type, and the morphism in category theory is analogous to a program in a computer. So we can actually make that mapping between a number of different types of systems, but this gives you like this way to approach computation through category theory. Um, and then there's so we have to build this analogy between physics and topology, uh, and then we have this sort of uh, this is the, the sea of jargon. So you have to navigate the sea of jargon. These are the concepts they kind of go through. So you have categories and category theory. 
you have monoidal categories, braided monoidal categories, symmetric monoidal categories, Cartesian categories, Cartesian closed categories. And then from that you get closed monoidal categories, closed, bra closed braided monoidal categories, closed symmetric monoidal categories. And then you go from that to compact monoidal categories, compact braided monoidal categories, and compact symmetric monoidal categories. So this is where you get this, these different types of categories in category theory. They were interested in for this purpose. Um, so yeah, it's, this kind of spells out what category theory is about. Um, it's basically where you have, I don't want to say sets, it's, I mean, it's kind of maybe a bit immature, but it's basically where you have these categories, they're kind of like sets, the sets are functional, you can map to ob objects to these groups, and then you can map functionally between them. And so there's a lot more to it than that, but that's basically the idea. Um, so they show this in diagram form. You have x, you have f, x to this category f to y. You have two morphisms connecting the output of one black box, the input the next. So the, the composite of uh, this function f x to y and g y to z looks like this. So you have these functors, which are these things here, and these morphisms. Uh, okay, so then you have. Okay, so this, this goes, it goes through this. They talk about then mapping these uh, diagrams to shapes. And so you can actually see where they're building to a model of computation where they're using this logical system and they're going to map it to uh, topology. And so then they're actually showing these morphisms being put into place in a topological space. And so then, uh, yeah, so this allows you to do some really interesting things in computation, in physical computation at that, because once you get up to a topology, it's actually quite, inter it gets quite interesting. And the kinds of relations you can make and programs you can build are very interesting. So this is a Wikipedia entry on computable topology. So this is the thing that we're kind of looking at in a broader sense. Um, computable topology is a discipline in mathematics that studies the topological and algebraic structure of computation. Computable topology is not to be confused with algorithmic or computational topology which studies the application of computation and topology. So we're actually looking at something else. We're looking at the structure of computation itself. And so um, some of this is, you know, if we look at the topology of lambda calculus, uh, the lambda calculus is strong enough to describe all mechanically computable functions. This is part of the Church-Turing thesis. Lambda calculus is thus effectively a programming language from which other languages can be built. When considering the topology of computation, it is common to focus on topology of uh, lambda calculus. Note that this is not necessarily a complete description of the topology of computation, since, since functions which are equivalent in the Church-Turing thesis sense may still have different topologies. So this is where they're going to get into topology. This goes back to the Church-Turing thesis, but we can also think of this in other ways. And so. There are a lot of ways people kind of approached this <clears throat> uh, in the past, uh, but you know we haven't really exploited the sort of nature of this fully, especially in this idea of the brain as a computer. Because when we talk about computers, we think of this digital computer, we think of uh, you know a very limited scope of computation. So that's topology and computation. Then there's something amorphological in computation. So we've talked about uh, topology. We've talked about putting things on shapes or uh, form of some type. It's a one type of form is morphology. And so in um, embodied cognition, <clears throat> you have robots, they have a body, but the body has a morphology. And this is a very simple example I'm giving you. That body has a morphology. And we think of the body maybe as this thing that is required for embodiment. So you might have a body that, say, 
frame space in a certain way, where you know you use your arms to interact with something or your legs to interact with something. But there's actually a field, an area of, of embodied intelligence, embodied cognition, that says, well, actually, there's a lot of computation going on in the morphology. So that's what this this uh, set of readings is about. So this article is on what is morphological computation and how the body contributes to cognition and control. So this kind of goes back to some of the things we've been talking about in the uh, Cognition Futures group. Uh, the abstract reads, the contribution of the body to cognition and control in natural and artificial agents is increasingly described as offloading computation from the brain to the body. So we've actually talked about offloading in this uh, group. We did a paper on uh, computational offloading where you're offloading things to the environment, offloading cognition to the environment, where you have an object in the environment and you're offloading cognitive capacity to that thing. <clears throat> so a stop sign is offloading of this idea that you need to stop at a certain point in space. So you could navigate traffic by just remembering to stop at the where you need to stop. But that's not very a very efficient way to do this. A more efficient way is to put up a sign that the agent can see and recognize and use that as the, the mechanism for getting stopping behavior. And so that's more efficient because it's shared by every agent in the population and it doesn't rely on memory. It doesn't rely on recall that can have error. So the sign, you know, sometimes we run stop signs, that's fine. But, um, you know, that's that's how offloading is efficient. And what they're talking about here is offloading computation from the brain to the body, which is different than offloading it to the environment. And so this is where you might offload computation from the brain to the body. It might be like, you know, how do you manipulate something? Do we have to have instructions in the brain for manipulating something? Or can the hand just feel the object and just kind of figure out how to manipulate? And this is where a lot of the stuff with affordances comes in. But also this is where a lot of the stuff with, um, you know, perception and action come in. Where, you know, we have a hand and we can kind of, you know, intuit our way to a solution. It's not a, co a computed solution that's pre-computed. It's that the body's doing the computation. And so it's a little bit, maybe a little bit different, although you have to understand that you also have a peripheral nervous system and that the peripheral nervous system does things to compute, like how to manipulate that object to figure it out. That's why, you know, when people talk about tech, the tactile experience being important, that's kind of what they're talking about, is offloading that computation to the hand or the body. And so in this uh, area of research, they say the body is said to perform morphological computation. So this is where they're doing this computation on the morphology. Our investigation of four characteristic cases of morphological computation in animals and robots shows that offloading perspective is misleading. Actually, they find that this is not the best way to, to describe this. Actually, the computation or the contribution of body morphology to cognition and control is rarely computational in any useful sense of the word. We thus distinguish three things. The first is that morphology facilitates control. Morphology per facilitates perception. In the rare case of morphology computation proper, such as reservoir computing, where the body is actually used for computation. These reservoir computing is an analogy. I would just say that the body is actually used for computation, but not in every case. So. In some cases, the morphology is actually facilitating control, so the computation may still be in the central nervous system, in the brain, and it's telling the hand what to do. But the hand has to figure things out locally. It has to figure out how to control something, the strategy for it. The computations are still in the brain, being sent down to the, to the hand. A morphology that facilitates perception. 
so you can't know the full properties of the object unless you touch it. So in your hand you have a ball. Is that ball solid or is it soft and squishy? Well, we can feel it to find out. You can't do that with a computational model in the brain because that computational model doesn't have all the information, doesn't have all the perceptive information. So this is what they're differentiating out, these, these parsing out these different aspects of it. And so this offloading perspective, I don't know if it's misleading in the sense that it doesn't describe everything. It isn't always offloading to the hand. It's using the hand and the, the central nervous system in, in certain ways. This result contributes to the understanding of the relation between embodiment and computation. The question for robot design and cognitive science is not whether computation is offloaded to the body, but what extent the body facilitates cognition and control, therefore how it contributes to the overall orchestration of intelligent behavior. Okay, so we're making a loop back to uh, the computers or the computation in the brain, where the brain is a computer. What they're arguing here is that the brain is interacting with the body. Some people with maybe a more um, radical stance would say that you're offloading things to the morphology, and the morphology is doing the computation. But in this case, they're saying that's not true. There's an interaction. So there's this whole field called morphological computation. The notion is fairly new and fairly vague with respect to the literature. There was a special issue of Artificial Life in 2013 on uh, morphological computation. Um, so the, the two uses of morphology uh, for explanation and engineering are combined in this category of morphological computation. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to define it in, in concrete terms. So we know that, like, there's an engineering aspect if you're building robots. There's an explanation aspect if you're interested in cognition. What are the mechanisms? Well, you know, we know that there's this analogy between robots and humans. We know there's this computational aspect, but that's about it. It does rely on this idea of cognition as computation, but it also it kind of includes this embodied perspective. So it's kind of interesting because in our Cognition Futures group, we've been talking about embodiment as sort of like this alternative, or at least a path towards an alternative to the, the brain as a computer, or cognition as computation. So if you think about the four E's, uh, which is embodiment, embeddedness, and activism, and extended uh, uh, cognition, they argue very explicitly that Cognition is not computation, at least not um, as a major feature of co uh, cognition. So uh, this is interesting because we have this connection to embodiment, but then it reintroduces the notion of computation being backdoor. So it's basically saying compute, almost like they're using computation as a stand-in term. They talk about this flexible ro sprawl robot, which is a dog and a conventional humanoid, walking over an uneven surface. So their idea of morphological computation, you can see that the dog and the humanoid, these are systems that have evolved for these kind of surfaces to walk on them, to have the sort of the control mechanisms in the, in the muscle and the central nervous system have a model for motor control that matches the, the context. In robot, how this, this robot here, um, and this robot can't handle the surface because it doesn't have the same set of joints and the same set of muscles that the dog or the even the humanoid robot is having trouble because it doesn't have this sort of morphological system in place. So this robot here on the left is really struggling, and you know it's kind of like uh, the big dog from Boston Robotics. I don't know if you've ever seen videos of that. Not the newer videos, but the older videos where it kind of like hops around and it had kind of has trouble with like inclines and steps and things like that. The newer versions are a little bit better at this, but uh, this is a robot here. It's a humanoid robot, but it still has trouble because it doesn't have that computational uh, aspect of the morphology. And so, you know, in a way it's kind of like looking at these three systems and saying, you know, 
there's a computational aspect to the morphology. But that's just kind of making an assumption because we don't really know what the mechanisms are. Um, I think one thing, there is a field called uh, neuromechanics that's actually quite useful, I think, in terms of understanding what's going on with the morphology and why it is, you know, can work in this way. So uh, they don't talk about neuromechanics here, but we might talk about that in the future, Peter. Um, so the, they kind of critique this whole view it's like, is it really substantive? Do we are we just saying like, well, the dog knows how to walk across the surface intuitively. Robots don't necessarily. So you know, it's obviously the computation, but that in and of itself isn't isn't an explanation. So they kind of critique this and they kind of bring up a lot of different things. They talk about these dynamic walkers, and they talk about other types of robots, all of which have different aspects. The dynamic walker exploits a sort of bi human bipedalism so there's this aspect of sort of human movement and it's more efficient than maybe some of these other crawling robots and then they're highly specialized morphologies like the gecko's hand that can grip surfaces so there are all sorts of things we can look at um then they talk about physical reservoir computing which is this object here which is this where you have this network within a reservoir, you have inputs and outputs, and you have this recurrent network of nonlinear springs and masses. What they're saying is that the spring mass computer can help us design a robot controller that is sort of conforms to this idea of morphological computation. So the book that, and then, okay, then they have this thing about the digital Turing computation, which is where we talk about, again, Classic notion of computation starts from a digitally encoded input, which is processed step by step, following an algorithm giving rise to a digital output. So this is our digital Turing computation. Um, one formalization of this notion of, of the Turing machine, which is an abstract device that manipulates symbols on a tape according to a table of rules. This computation is serial and batch, as they refer to it. That is, computation is finished and complete output is provided only once the machine halts. So this is the whole idea of uh, the, uh, the Turing machine, the church Turing thesis is all and only the effective computational functions could be computed by a Turing machine. And then they talk about lambda calculus. And then so if, to move from one digital state to another in a Turing machine is a step-by-step -step process that follows a finite rule that has an algorithm, which is itself formal. So the computation is a purely syntactic process, which means it has, it puts together rules that can be realized in several different ways on a physical device. It is thus multiply realizable. But since the states are digital, it is exactly multiply realizable. I'm not really sure where they're going with that, but it's sort of the way they think about this connection. And they talk about natural computation. What is a physical system compute? It's, uh, you know, this is taking it from the abstract level to what the physical system is actually computing. Um, so they don't really get into kind of what is going on here, but they kind of talk about this in terms of uh, making this distinction between a digital computer, say, and a physical system computer. Um, yeah, so that, I think that's it for that article. Um, this article is Morphological Computation and Morphological Control, Steps Towards a Formal Theory and Applications. This is, I think, is from a, a Life Journal as well. Um, and this abstract reads, Morphological Computation can be loosely defined as the exploitation of the shape, material properties, and physical dynamics of a physical system to improve the efficiency of a computation. So again, we have this theme of like all the aspects of a physical system, maybe like a robot body or a human body or an animal body, not human animal body, um, as this thing that can improve the efficiency of a computation. Perhaps not the locus of computing itself, but as a, a systemic aid. Morphological control and the application of morphological computing is the application of more morphological computing to a control task. In its theoretical part, this article sharpens and extends these definitions by suggesting new formalized definitions 
and identifying areas in which the definitions we propose are still inadequate. We go on to describe three ongoing studies which apply morphological control to problems in medicine and chemistry. So there's uh, an inflatable support system for patients with impaired movement. This is based on macroscopic physics. The two other case studies are self-assembly of chemical bioreactors and a model of induced cell repair and radio-oncology. So this describes physical processes at the micrometer scale. Um, so this involves different types of emergent dynamics and stochastic processes such as diffusion. Now I want to go to some of these other things. Uh, so they, they actually go through some a number of issues that often arise in discussions. So the first is that the concept of morphological computation, as we understand it, does not imply any notion of hypercomputation. All the computational and error control problems we discuss in our case studies are computable by a conventional Turing machine. Unlike the Turing machine, however, morphological computation does not define a class of computational problems. So Turing machine defines Turing computable problems. Morphological computation does not imply any sort of class of computational problems. It's rather a method for solving such problems. So in Mars terminology, and we talk about Mars three levels a lot in, in the group, um, we have the computational level, the implementation level. Uh, this concept belongs to the comp not to the computational level, but to the implementation level. In other words, this is just an operational definition more than a theoretical definition. In our work, we use morphology to mean the combination of shape and material properties, elasticity, friction coefficients, and so on. By this definition, morphology includes material as well as geometric properties. Three, in what follows, we distinguish between computation and control. Morphological control means control achieved via morphological computation. Four, the concepts of morphological computation and control overlap to some extent with control theory. So in control theory, there's this idea of the reference, which provides an exact specification of the way parameters should behave. In morphological control, as we will see, no reference is explicitly required. So this is something that differs from control theory. Morphological computing over, also overlaps with something called natural computing. The attempt to implement conventional computational processes using non-electronic means, so like DNA computation or membrane computation. And we've talked a little bit about that in some of the previous sessions. However, the two fields have different emphasis. So in natural computing, we want to demonstrate that a specific system of natural computing is universal. We've talked about universal computation and this idea of pan computation. The literature on morphological computation attaches much less importance to this concept. In most cases, the goal of morphological computing is to control specific devices in a potentially broad context that may be specified to a certain domain, uh, which may or may not allow the representation of a particular class of mathematical problem. So for example, Hamiltonian graph problem. Um, six, in this view we present, the main goal of morphological control is to perform control tasks in a more efficient manner than would be possible with conventional computing technology. So this is more about robotics and some of the things that you would be interested in there. Uh, now I wanna, yeah, I wanna go to sort of the way they think about this. This is a good figure, figure one. This is the conventional control scheme. So this is where you have, uh, in A, you have um, a conventional control scheme at the top, and then in B, you have a control scheme using morphological control. So if we look at A, we have this uh, robot, we have binary sequence as, to, as the representation for this behavior. We have this translation of sensory input into binary sequences. We have this processing of binary sequences. This is part of conventional computation, where we're computing on binary sequences, we're applying Turing computable things, and we're building a representation of things. Then we have, but, but in robots, we also have these physical dynamics, which are noise and things like that. Uh, also movement, 
and manipulation. So we have these physical dynamics, we have this traditional computation, and we're building these representations as binary sequences as well. They're being mapped back to the robot, and that robot that was interacting with the physical world, which means that there's an interaction there that we need to sort of make some sort of action out of. And so there are a lot of there's a lot of computation there, which is what they call sort of this, you know, what they're interested in morphological computation. This is the sort of the traditional view. Now, in their view, they have a robot. They're by they create the binary, you know, it takes sensory input in, it's processing it, it's producing these binary sequences, it produces a representation. This is again conventional computation. And then in this case, they're not worried about physical dynamics of noise, they're worried about physical dynamics as a whole, and then that gives you the robot, you have the binary sequences that get mapped to the robot's morphology, and you have this action. And so the difference is, is that you're treating this, this these physical dynamics less as just noise, right? So in a traditional uh, mode, you're really interested in what the robot is what sort of thinking what's in its sort of internal model. And then you're just mapping that back out to the robot. You're saying, if the robot encounters anything from the environment, it's noise, we can uh, control around it, we can compute around it. In this uh, B, in this morphological computing scenario, you actually worry about the physical dynamics. You think of the physical world as a dynamical system, and it's still not like the best representation, but it's better than just treating it as noise and incorporating that into the computation. So, you know, this, this requires us to think in terms of dynamical systems. So this is, these are some sketches of dynamical systems that we need to think about. So this is all very much related to dynamical systems. And we're talking about that currently in our um, Cognition Futures group. And so then, uh, this article is morphological computation, nothing but physical computation. This just really reduces morphological computation to physical computation explicitly. So the abstract here reads, the purpose of this paper is to argue against the claim that morphological computation is substantially different from other kinds of physical computation. Um, I show that some but not all purported cases of morphological computation do not count as specifically computational, and that those that do are solely physical computing systems. These latter cases, where they're solely physical computing systems, however, specific enough, uh, are not, however, specific enough. All computational systems, not only morphological ones, may and sometimes should be studied in various ways, including their energy efficiency, cost reliability, and durability. Second, I criti criti uh, critically analyze the notion of offloading computation to the morphology of an agent or robot by showing that literally computation is sometimes not offloaded, but simply avoided. So this is an interesting point. We talked about offloading and some of these strategies. And so the, this is another critical thing that's critical of this offloading concept. Third, I point out that while the morphology of any agent is indicative of the environment that it's adapted to or informative about that environment. It does not follow that every agent has access to its morphology as a model of the environment. So that's interesting that, you know, we think about this, we kind of assume that the agent is a model of its morphology. And in fact, it may not. This may be not, they may not have access to this model. And thus, it's not worth thinking about, like, what the morphology is contributing to the computation. But nevertheless, I think you can see this difference where we have this, you know, again, we have this, I can draw this out as a, this is, I think, will be interesting for our cognition futures discussions, as well as some of our uh, cognition, cognitive science discussions. So let me get morph morphological computation. And this is where we have the body here. The brain. 
inside of the body. And we assume that maybe there's an interaction here between the body and the brain. This has some, this interacts with the environment. So now, you know, the, the question arises, there is computation in the brain. That's an assumption we make. And so the idea is, is some of that computation offloaded. So offloaded. And it doesn't necessarily have to be from the brain to the body. It could be from the brain to the environment as well. So we can have this offloading to the environment. And then, of course, this is the extended part of the four E's. So this is um, either morphological. to the fourth E, which is extended. We've had some discussions about what the four E's actually mean. And actually, one of the, none of the four E's are about the morphology or about the phenotype being the computational thing. It's always like embedded, which means, I guess, that the brain is embedded in a body or in a context. But they don't actually talk about this in four E. Cognition. Just, just so we're clear on that. Uh, so there's this offloading aspect. Then there's this computation aspect. So the idea here is that it's not just that things are offloaded or not. Sometimes, you know, it's debatable whether some of these things are computable or, or computed. So. Uh, So, are things computable or computed? So this is one here, offloaded computation. The third thing is um, this idea of pan computation. So pan computation is this thing where, you know, computing is sort of, uh, if I have a brain computer, it's equivalent to something in the environment. It could be equivalent to like a physical process. So, you know, digital versus physical. And so then, you know, this, this brings up a question about, like, if we have a, this offloading to the environment or to the body, is it the same type of computation? Are they compatible computations? Or, you know, what? obviously, if it's like the peripheral nervous system, it shouldn't be, like, if it's an arm or a hand, it shouldn't be too different than what's going on in the brain. Like, it's just part of that same system. It's a little bit different. So if there's like a manipulandum here, the end effector, that computation can feel things, it can relay into the brain. It's the same, it's compatible, it's the same type of computation. But if you have a physical computation in the environment, can you offload to that physical computation? Can you recover that to, to the digital computation? What what's the the relationship there? And what they're mentioning here is that um, with morphological computation, it's really kind of this applied enterprise where they don't really care about like, the computational theory aspect. They just need it to work in the real world where you have these problems in robots. Okay, so that's, I think, uh, enough on morphological computation. I think there was a fourth point that I can't remember right now what it was. Um, but I think this is enough for this. Uh, th I think there are a lot of questions that might come up. Um, if people are watching the recording and you want to talk about it more, we can talk about it in one of the channels. Um, but anyways, yeah, I think that's a good overview of that. So let's move on to the third part here, which is RNA's universal computation. So I think we've talked a little bit about DNA and universal computation. 
uh, or you know building like DNA computers and things like that. And those are, of course, using like the chemical structure and the organization, the structure and the function to build a computer to do computational stuff. So you actually do have uh, DNA computers that can like compute very simple things. So that's a you know, promising area of research. This is an RNA-based theory of natural universal computation. Um, and this is where, you know, they're building, um, building computers out of RNA. So the difference between DNA and RNA is that DNA is generally a linear strip. It could be a circular strip. Uh, whereas RNA has secondary structure. And, but, you know, they're, they're overlapping because you can do a lot of things, you know, with molecular biology. They're small computers. You can interact with the biology of a system, these sorts of things. Um, so there, there are different advantages trying to use this. And the question here is that do DNA and RNA systems, do these kind of molecular systems behave like our digital computers? And so this is where they're kind of going with this. Now, this, this article says that it's universal computation, so they're saying it can, but let's see what they have to say here. The abstract reads, life is confronted with computation problems in a variety of domains, including animal behavior, single cell behavior, and embryonic development. So we don't know of a natural existing biological system that is capable of universal computation, which is Turing equivalent in scope. So there's this Turing equivalency aspect. Does it resemble a digital computer? Some of the Turing rules that we put forth by the Turing Church thesis. Generic finite dimensional dynamics, cis dynamical systems, which encompass most models of neural networks, intracellular signaling cascades, and gene regulatory networks. So they actually have this class called generic finite dimensional dynamical systems. So neural networks and gene regulatory networks fall into these categories, which is Interesting because I wouldn't think that those two things are equivalent. Uh, I think gene regulatory networks he means like the generic sense of the regulation because I've been doing some reading on gene regulatory networks separate of this, and I can tell you that it's very hard. The sort of the uh, computability aspect is not, uh, it's not always the same. Uh, it's not clear to me whether they're Turing complete, etc. So I don't know what, what it is going with this, but I guess this is the class here. Generic finite dimensional dynamical systems. But these kind of systems fall short of universal computation. Okay, But they are assumed to be capable of explaining cognition and development. So in the case of neural networks, it can explain cognition, and we've talked about the shortcomings it has there. And then gene regulatory networks can describe development, course, you know, that there are, again, shortcomings to that because it's hard to define the, the right gene regulatory network that would, say, build an embryo. If you just had the right network, would it build an embryo? Well, it's, it's hard to know because no one's done it. So I guess that's probably a, uh, a, there's a parallel problem there between gene regulatory networks and development and neural networks and cognition, but that's something for another time. I presented a class of models that bridge two concepts from distant fields, combinatory logic or lambda calculus. So this is this lambda calculus we were talking about. This is combinatorics in this combinatorial logic and RNA molecular biology. So this is something very amenable to combinatory logic because RNA molecules have these bases, just like DNA. They have secondary structure. They go on to build amino acids, which go to build proteins. So they have this, this high information content, but also they have phenotypes that are sort of this topological aspect to it. A set of basic RNA editing rules can make it possible to compute any computable function with identical algorithmic complexity to that of Turing machines. So this is RNA editing rules. These are natural uh, editing rules that exist in nature. These are what he's arguing here is that it's possible to compute any function with something identical or at least approximating Turing machines. The models do not ex assume extraordinarily complex molecular machinery or any processes that radically differ from what we already know to occur in cells. Distinct independent enzymes can mediate each of these rules, 
in RNA molecules solve the problem of uh, parentheses matching their, their secondary structure. Um, this is these loop, these hairpin loops and, and things like that. Um, and the most plausible of these models of all the editing rules can be implemented in nearly cleavage and ligation operations. So something they'll do in a lot of DNA computing is they'll have these operations, just like in a regular digital computer, where you're cutting and pasting, basically. And so cleavage and ligation are, you know, where you're taking something out, you're adding something in. So cleavage and ligation might be like an, an, a subtraction and an addition operator in digital computing. At fixed positions relative to predefined motifs. This demonstrates that universal computation is well within the reach of molecular biology. It is therefore reasonable to assume that life has evolved or possibly began with a universal computer that yet remains to be discovered. The variety of seemingly unrelated computational problems across many scales can potentially be solved using the same RNA-based computation system. So this is really interesting. He's saying that there's like RNA-based computation could answer a number of different problems uh, in computation as well, you know, as well as being the basis for biology. So this is an interesting paper. Um, this is a graphic showing this. This is a slide from this person gave a talk on YouTube. It's actually on Mike Levin's channel. Um, this shows sort of this idea of universal computation being missing in biology. So a lot of theoretical biology does not include this idea of universal computation with uh, the work of Stephen Wolfram accepted, I guess. He's not really a biologist, but uh, so you have these kinds of neural networks and dynamical systems that have been shown to be capable of universal computation or unrealistic. They cannot have found to be found to occur in nature or even physically built. This is a citation for more in 1998. So this is this idea that these sorts of things are not equivalent. What you're seeing here, you're seeing molecular transduction pathways, gene regulatory networks leading to an embryo, uh, this neurophysiology, uh, you have these, you know, a bee pollinating something or a baby listening to music, a human baby listening to music, and there's a, this neurophysiology going on underneath. So these sorts of things are not, you know, People have not thought of these things to be equivalent. These are, this is, uh, I think, kind of explicitly stated in a lot of biology, but there doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just means that we haven't, don't have a good model for it. So this is again from that talk. A universal computer can carry any calculable function. This is an example of a Turing machine where you're going down this tape and you're hitting like a halting point. These are the rules for this machine. This is what they call a finite length descriptor. And basically, this is analogous to moving down a stretch of DNA or RNA and like finding a halting point where you maybe transcribe or translate the sequence. And you have like, you have things like stop codons, in fact, where you take a stretch of it. You start one place, you stop at another place. That's a piece of information that can be extracted from that. You also have ligation operations uh, and other things where you can change the structure itself. So these are all things, you know, if we think about DNA and RNA as like a tape, a binary tape, and people have both in terms of like computational biology and in synthetic biology. So this is a, you know, this is the model we're going with. Uh, and then finally, there's this idea of what is computation. This is from the same talk. This is where we kind of talk about computation problems, and computation systems. So if we think again back to the DNA and RNA physical computing example and map it to this, what we're doing is we're taking some input domain and mapping it to an output domain. So, you know, so in some cases you're taking a problem and you're representing it or you're transforming it from one set of, from one domain to another. And so what we're doing in computation here is maybe we're mapping something from a digital computer to like DNA or RNA computer to a physical computer. And that requires a mapping. Or we're mapping something from the real world to a DNA or RNA computer. So, you know, we could 
like take a, a an image and you can encode it in DNA, or you could take like a, a sentence and encode it in DNA. You have to go from the input domain to the output domain, and then the computation problem is how do you represent that? So how do you represent a sentence in a stretch of DNA? And people have actually worked on that. People have worked on like uh, different gene circuits where they're able to express different patterns and things like that. It's quite interesting, the kinds of things, but this requires you to have this input to output domain mapping. Then he talks about a computation system, which is where you have an input and output, and a descriptor that translates that input to an output. So the descriptor could be a configuration, instructions, certain parameters, an algorithm, or some code that you insert that makes that transformation possible. So you have this transformation from input to output domain, and that is controlled by this descriptor, which is this algorithm. And so what we need for this, we don't have, what we have for physical or for digital computers, is this algorithm or these instructions that tell it how to map the problem and then what to do with it. So it takes an input and creates an output. So that's uh, all I'm gonna talk about for that. I think that was a good um, set of readings and I think that kind of wraps up what we've been talking about with respect to physical computation and the relationship with that and digital computation and the idea of the brain as a computer and all that. So. Questions about any of that? Or, I know Morgan's the only one here, so. So, yeah, that's that's all I have for today. If you're watching online, you know, we can talk about this more in the Slack. Um, or, you know, we can follow up on different points. Please bring them to my attention so we can craft some materials accordingly. Uh, now, this is on the causality. Uh, section on the physical computation section, you know, this is not the end of it. I mean, there's a lot more out there I didn't cover. So I tried to cover things that I thought were interesting or that guided us in a certain direction. But if you're interested in, you know, other things, there are many other things out there to explore. And I have certainly learned a lot about both topics by doing this. So, Okay. Well, thanks for attending, Morgan. I uh, hope everyone else is doing well in our community. Um, and have a good week.